So Tiffany, you are the vice president of television at Heartbeat. What is that? You're a development exec, you're a producer. What do you, what do you do? Great question. What is the most fun about my job? I would say is that it is all encompassing. Like every day feels, you know, completely different. But if I was to strip it down, you know, bare bones definition, I work for a production company that develops sells and produces television shows, uh, also features, but I work mostly on the TV side. So it's my job to work with writers that have, you know, cool ideas or to search for IP or connect with talent that have, you know, shows that they want to make and really just shepherd those shows through the process to ultimately, hopefully, uh, rarely, but, you know, when it happens, uh, it feels great to get them on the air. And then once a show gets on the air, I help oversee the production of that show and, and support the writers and the showrunners in producing the project. How do you see your role as a creative? Like, how are you able to express your creativity through your work? I would say it's twofold because in order to be a development executive, like you kind of have to have two sides to your brain. You have to be creative. You have to love, you know, the medium in which you're developing content. Like I watch everything on television. Like I did not grow up in the household where you were not allowed to watch TV. We had a TV in every single room. Like we watched a lot of movies, read a lot of books, like a lot of video games, like storytelling was just something that I was always, you know, involved in. So A, just a love of stories and, and storytelling and talking to people about that, talking to writers about it, like that's the best part of the job. But the other half of it is knowing the marketplace. So as much as I'm sitting down all day with writers, reading scripts, you know, developing ideas, looking for books that could potentially be adapted into TV shows or movies. I'm also calling agents. I'm also calling, you know, executives at buyers or other executives at production companies and just knowing what is on their slates and like what they are looking for at all times. So it's really just like staying in communication, knowing what they're looking for, but also just having my own personal taste and making sure that I'm meeting and working with people and surrounding myself by writers with writers that we just feel aligned creatively so I think it's those two pieces of the job that that work hand in hand together and then as a writer will come to me and you know they'll have an idea about something and I'm able to say oh, okay great based on the hundreds of samples that I've read in the past like you know six months this idea is pretty common I know they've read something like this, like, how do we build this up? How do we make this feel more unique? How can I be helpful in just making this idea feel like it'll actually, you know, sell and still tr stay true to the writer's initial seed of, a, of an idea, if that makes sense. So oftentimes you are getting a script, right? Some sort of sample to start with. What are these scripts that you're getting and, and what are you looking for in them? When I'm being set up or just trying to learn about a writer's voice or when I'm looking to staff a show, I'm reading samples, which I consider to be the writer's like cover letter. This is the representation of you as a writer and like the types of shows that you want to write on, your point of view, your tone, the things that you want to talk about, like that goes into your sample. I always say the sample can be as zany as you want it to be. Make sure it is completely representative of you and what you want to create. You can write about your upbringing. You can write a crazy story that just like really showcases your tone. Don't just write a sample that you think could potentially be produced one day if this is your first writing sample. I found that the most memorable samples that I've read are just very personal in a way that I know exactly who the writer is and not even doesn't even have to be anything personal about them, but just like the type of content that they want to write. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I can staff you on this show. So when a show gets a green light and that I'm producing, I will sit down with the creator and with the showrunner and they'll talk about like the first season, kind of tonally what they want, 
what type of people they want in the room. And if it's a second season show, you know, they'll say, hey, the first season was hard funny. This season's going to be a little bit more dramatic, so I need more of a balance. Or they'll say, I need some people that are really great with story. I need more people that are great with jokes because like I have these two people that are really fast writers and they're great with stories, so we're going to have that covered. Or I have a really big arc about a character who's going through therapy, so I'd like to have, you know, a writer who has experienced something like this in the room. Most of the time it's like incoming calls because agents want their clients to get staffed on shows. But I will call all of the agencies and say, hey, I'm looking for X amount of writers at these levels for this show. And they'll start sending me people and then I'll just read a bunch of people. What is the path, you know, uh, for aspiring writers, you know, like they start here and, you know, they're developing their talent and they're trying to get over here. Do you have any words of advice for how to bridge that gap? Yes. If you aren't making a short film and getting it into, you know, a festival, you just have to like network your way into someone's inbox, honestly. I remember when I first started out, like as an executive, I was so intimidated by cold calling people and like calling agents that I didn't know or like going to parties by myself or d doing all that kind of stuff. And then you realize it's like, oh, everyone, no one, everyone's afraid to do this kind of stuff. And everyone is also wants to be good at their job. So if you meet someone, it is just as beneficial for them to have you as a contact as it is for you to have them as a contact. Yeah. So it is like mutually beneficial for both parties. And when you think of it that way, there's no shame in asking for someone's email address and sending them an email every six months, letting them know what you're up to, even if they don't respond. Like, who cares? Like, you just kind of have to persevere. Obviously, it's important to have connections of people at every single level, but your most important networking connections are people at your level because you will rise in a class together. I'm sure you also read a lot of bad scripts. Are there any common things you see in there, some pointers maybe you can give for things to avoid or things to aim for um, as you're writing this script that's gonna become your calling card? I would say less about, cause like you're either a good writer or not a good writer. So like, you know, it's if you're a good writer, you're gonna pull something great out of a, I'm just assuming that everyone here is a good writer. I think having a concept that feels too broad is I think the biggest, I don't want to say annoyance, but like that's a thing that will, that's something that will make me check out of reading, you know, a project. Cause there are just certain ideas and certain ways into shows that are very common and, you know, overused. And I think it sucks people out of, you know, whatever creativity could happen at the end of the pilot. Like, if in the first 10 pages of your pilot, your character inherits an Airbnb in a different state, I'm probably not going to finish reading it. If, you know, you wrote a pilot about an assistant in Hollywood, like who is not being given a chance, I'm not going to finish the pilot. It's just like little, like there are just tropes that I think back in the day were a lot easier to get away with because again, there were not that, there wasn't a variety of television shows, you know, on the four broadcast networks. So it's harder to to stand out. But if you have something that feels unique, like I think that's the best bet to get someone to continue reading your project. Mm. And also like it is important for writers to read. If you can get access to other people's, you know, sample, that's why Mike is like, hey, get in a writer's group so that you're reading other people's projects. If you're reading other writer samples, if you are fortunate enough to get repped, ask your reps, can I just read five samples? Like read feature scripts, like you can find a lot of scripts, like read all the pilots that are available, you know, online. Like it's important to read what other writers are writing because then you have a sense of like what's floating around out there and you're not just going in blind. What is the most enjoyable aspect of your role in the industry? Also the least enjoyable aspect? Great question. Um, most enjoyable. I mean, it's so rare when it happens, but you know, like working with a writer that I just 
believe in creatively like so much where it's like I really love your voice I want to like help do whatever I can and the project sells and it gets on the air or working on a show that you think is just so good anytime I get to work on something that I feel really really creatively aligned with and or get to champion a voice that I think without the weight of my company behind like Kevin's company not my but the place I work um without the weight of that like they would not be seen or you know their projects wouldn't be considered but I'm like hey like I like this person I believe in them I want to champion them like that's the best part of of my job and talking to writers like I love talking about story I love like pitching ideas to help like get the the juices flowing the least enjoyable aspect will always be getting a pass on a project that I really really believe in it's the worst call to get and it's the worst call to make to the writer uh tiff what are your next career steps do you ever picture yourself owning your own production company do you want to be a mogul what what is the end goal are you for trying you? to send me into an existential crisis quentin <laughs> um, i don't know micah said something earlier it was like network with people that you like surround yourself by people that you like hollywood's full of a lot of different types of people and I really like the people at this company. I've been able to grow and I feel, you know, happy and respected. And I've never really based my career on like climbing any sort of ladder. Like I started off thinking that I wanted to oversee budgets and I studied documentary filmmaking and like I just always kind of chased the things that I was interested in. So, I don't know what my, you know, next career steps are. It's not that I don't have like a a vision for it. It's just I'm always chasing what's going to make me happiest. Hopefully whatever I'm doing I'm happy. <laughs> well, awesome. well, I think that's a good that's a good yeah. note to end on uh chase your happiness. Tiffany, thank you so much for joining us.